So today we have um, the second lecture by Jarek Kopinski on applications of tractor calculus in general relativity. Thank you for the introduction. So before I continue, let me recall what I talked about on the previous lecture. So just as a reminder, I'm working in a setting of n-dimensional Lorentzian manifold M, which is equipped with the conformal class of metric C of signature n minus 1, 1. And the goal of the previous lecture was to introduce tractor calculus, uh, the tractor bundle and tractor connection in this setting. And the first step to do it was uh, the, uh, was the introduction of various definitions of definitions of various uh, conformally uh, weighted bundles. And among those bundles, there was a bundle of conformally weighted scalars of weight one or scales, which can be used to write down conformally covariant condition equivalent to the statement that there is a Einstein metric in the conformal class. And this I call this condition almost Einstein equation and it's visible here in equation one. So the prolongation of this equation allowed me to introduce tractor bundle and the tractor connection, which in turn uh, allowed me to write this, uh, the equivalent prolonged system to the almost Einstein equation in a compact form visible in equation two where I sigma is a scale tractor corresponding to the scale sigma hat, which can be defined with the use of conformally covariant Thomas D operator, and nabla T is just a tractor connection. So we see that the, uh, the almost Einstein equation is now equivalent to the, uh, to the existence of parallel tractor I sigma hat. So another important property of this tractor is that its length squared square gives a conformally covariant notion of the scalar curvature as visible on the right hand side of equation three. Okay, so that was those were the main points for the previous lecture. So now moving forward, I will assume that my manifold uh, has a space like boundary sigma. So the fact that the boundary is space-like is not really important right now, but it will be important uh, later on when I'll start talking about applications to general relativity. But I can mind as well that the boundary is space-like right from the start, which I'm going to do. So I also want to have a scale sigma, which is a defining density of the boundary, i.e. the sigma is zero on the boundary and it has non-zero gradient there, as in equation four. So now because of this gradient is non-zero, I can use it to define normal vector or extension of the normal vector of the boundary to the bulk. And this extension will be denoted by N and is just defined as the gradient of sigma as in equation five. So now this extension of the normal vector or just the normal vector can be used to, to define the induced conformal metric on the boundary. Uh, which is denoted by the g bar and uh, and 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 defined in equation six. So we have a fairly standard formula on the right hand side, which uh, contains the conformal metric and the normal vector uh, in the second term. So now, because I'm talking about uh, uh, we're in the realm of tractor calculus, and it's it's also useful to define a tractorial version of this this normal vector which is usually called called the normal tractor and this guy can be just can be defined just as the restriction of the scale tractor corresponding to the defining density sigma to the boundary as in equation seven so so the right hand side of this so the structure from equation seven has the a normal vector in the middle slot and and the mean curvature in some mean curvature h in some scale scale g such that this whole tractor transforms in a, in a nice way okay so now we have uh, an ambiguity here and the ambiguity is as follows so suppose that we 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 look at our defining density sigma and multiply it by some positive function f as in as in eight so if we do it, then we'll see that this new scale f sigma is also a defining density of the boundary. Uh, so which means in, in fact that we have an infinite number of, of defining densities. And in order to specify one, one defining density from this, this infinite set, I'm going to assume an additional condition. And this additional condition is as follows. 
So I want to take any defining density sigma and find a C positive C infinity function F such that the singular metric G naught, which can be constructed from the scale F sigma has constant scalar curvature. And I'll just assume that the scalar curvature has value N times N minus one as in 10. So if you recall what I told you uh, on the last lecture or two minutes ago, then uh, this, there is a conformally covariant version of the scalar curvature in the form of the norm of the scale tractor. So instead of looking at equation 10, I'll, I'll look at the conformally covariant version of this equation. So what I want to assume here is that the I squared of F sigma so I, this, the norm of the scale tractor of my new scale F sigma is minus one uh, as in equation 11. So this implies that the, the norm of the vector N hat, which, is, which, is, which can be defined as the gradient of F sigma, uh, has norm minus one on the boundary and minus one plus some linear terms in the bulk uh, as in equation 12, which in turn means that n hat is now can be thought of as the extension of the unit normal vector of the boundary to the bulk. Okay, but a question arises. So can I can I can I solve can I find such can I find f such that this scalar curvature has has constant value n and minus one or uh, or or can I can I solve my singular Yamabe equation? So this equation that i squared of f sigma is minus one. And the answer is yes, because yes, if I'm only looking in the, because if I only interested in the local neighborhood of the boundary, then I can solve this equation formally by with the use of improvement procedure. And this procedure uh, goes as follows. So in the first step, I'm, I'm taking uh, any, uh, some defining density sigma naught and normalize it on the boundary such that the I squared of the sigma naught is minus one. Or more, or more generic, generally, the I squared of sigma naught is minus one plus some linear terms in sigma naught as in 13. So now in the next step, I'm constructing sigma, some next, some, another defining density sigma one from sigma naught uh, and, and define sigma one as sigma naught plus some alpha times sigma naught, naught squared. Plug this, uh, plug, sig plug this form of sigma one into singular Yamabe equation, solve for alpha, and, and again achieve that the I squared R of my new scale sigma one is minus one plus quadratic terms, uh, as in 14. And I can do this step n minus one times, and, uh, and the result is scale uh, sigma n minus one which uh, such that the I squared of the scale is minus one plus some terms uh, of order N in the, the scale, in the scale sigma N minus one. Now, if you try to improve it further, uh, i.e. try to try to achieve uh, I squared of, of sigma N being equal to minus one plus some terms of order N plus one, then we will see that it's impossible because there is an obstruction of solving this singular Yamabe problem uh, uh, further. So, so we, which is an important uh, problem on its own, but I'm not gonna talk about it here. So to summarize, uh, forgetting about any subscripts, uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm going to assume that I already did this improvement procedure and that my scale sigma is a singular Yamabe scale. So that the I squared of this scale is minus one plus some terms of order N uh, in, in this scale as in 16. So now I can take this scale and use it to define the extension of the normal tractor of, of the boundary to the bulk. And if we recall, I denoted the normal tractor just as a, the restriction of the scale tractor to the boundary. So naturally, if I want, if I now want to define the extension of the normal tractor, I can do it just by assuming that this extension of the normal tractor NE is just uh, just equals the scale tractor. But now the scale tractor is is can is computed with respect to the singular Yamabe scale sigma, as in seventeen. So natural consequence of 16 and 17 is that 
the norm of my extension of the normal tractor Ne is minus one plus some, some terms of order N in sigma as in 18, which in fact means that the Ne is the extension of the unit normal tractor because of this, the, because its norm is minus one on the boundary. Uh, uh, Yaroslav, uh, can, I, can I ask you, is this all sigma L, is it along the entire boundary or is it just local near the boundary? I mean, this is the global with respect to entire boundary. Yeah, so I'm looking at the local neighborhood of the boundary, like global, local, <laughs> globally. Uh, so it's like tubular neighborhood, it's like product there, right? Sorry? It's it's like tubular neighborhood of the boundary. It's yeah, local. exactly, exactly, it is. Yeah. Okay, and, and what kind of theorems allows you to, to kill all those terms? You mean to kill the lower order terms? Yeah, order by order, yes. I mean, you can you, you can just do it. I mean, I, I talked about this improvement procedure here. So we can start by some any defining density and just uh, construct new densities, plug them into equation and solve for the coefficients to, to kill those lower order terms. But when you say solve, what, what kind? Of solve the this this constant scalar curvature equation, which in this setting is called singular Yamabe equation. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so now uh, what can be done with this extension of the unit normal tractor is uh, it can be used to study the, the geometry of, of, my, of my boundary sigma or more generic, gener generically the geometry of some embedded hypersurface, but here I'm focusing on the, of the boundary. And the, the, this geometry can be studied in, in terms of so-called conformal fundamental forms, which were defined in this paper by Sam Blitz, Rod Gover, and Andrew Waldron from 2021. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to review this, this result, the result with the definition of conformal fundamental forms. Okay, so the first, I, I've already talked about first conformal fundamental form and Although it can be defined with the use of tractors, I already defined it with the use of tensors. So I'm just going to repeat the definition here. So the first conformal fundamental form is just the induced conformal metric. So uh, 19, I've written this definition of, of induced conformal metric again in 19. So we have the, the full conformal metric and the, the unit normal vector and hat on the right hand side. So now to define second conformal metric, we can uh, we can recall the definition of the usual second fundamental form from Riemannian geometry. So what we what we're doing there is we're taking a connection, applying to the extension of the unit normal vector, projecting on the hypersurface or, or to the boundary here, and uh, that that's that's the way in which the sec second fundamental form can be defined. So here we're working with tractors, so we can, but we can do similar things. So we can take the extension of the unit normal tractor, apply the tractor connection, project with respect to the induced conformal metric, and the resulting tractor will have a form visible computed in some, some scale G, will, G bar will have a form visible on the right hand side of 20, where K naught is just the trace free second fundamental form or trace free extrinsic curvature. So the second conformal fundamental form can be defined now as uh, uh, as the the tensorial part of the structure from the right hand side of twenty. So we can decree that the the second conformal fundamental form is just the trace free part of the extrinsic curvature. Now because there we have a zero in the top slot of the structure from twenty, we know that an or from just a direct computation, we know that this trace-free extrinsic curvature is conformally covariant, so it, it's a good candidate for, for the conformal fundamental form. Okay, so now going to higher order fundamental form, conformal fundamental forms. Before, before I go to the definition of higher order conformal fundamental forms, 
let me recall how a high order fundamental forms can be defined in the setting of Riemannian geometry using simple example. So if you have a surface is a surface in R3, then the third fundamental form K3 or and the next one um, by analogy can be defined as follows. So what you want to do is you want to take a extension of the unit normal vector n hat, apply a derivative, apply, apply a connection, and then apply a normal derivative in the direct direction of this unit normal vector n project. And that's your definition of third fundamental form visible in 21. So now to define, to define uh, conformal fundamental forms, we need to look at basically look at 21 and uh, con firstly construct two things and, and construct two things. Firstly, the conformally covariant way to, uh, to take a connection applied to the unit extension of the unit normal vector. And secondly, conformally covariant way of taking this normal derivative in the direction of n hat. So the way to, to I already talked about the way to, to, to construct a conformally covariant uh, version of taking a connection and applying it to the extension of the unit normal vector, because uh, as, in, as in the second conformal fundamental form, you can just take extension of the unit normal tractor, apply the tractor connection, and that's, that's, that's your uh, conformally covariant way of taking nabla and, and hat. Uh, so yeah, so 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 because uh, so, so now what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to denote this uh, denote this take denote the taking a uh, taking a tractorial derivative of the extension of the unit normal tractor by E A B E from extension because what this this tensor is is actually an extension of the trace free part of the extrinsic curvature. So if we if we compute this uh, the EAB which is now uh, which which can be done by applying a nabla t to n e and then extracting the tensorial slot from the resulting tractor. So here I denoted Q star by the operation of extracting uh, this tensorial slot from from tractor. We'll see that this guy is actually the almost Einstein operator which now are, is acting on my singular Yamabe scale sigma as in the right-hand side of 22, where you have where n hat now is just the gradient of the singular Yamabe scale sigma. So we see that tensor EAB is a, a nice conformally covariant tensor because, because it's just the, the almost Einstein operator acting on some scale, i.e. it's a section of the trace-free uh, symmetric bundle of trace free symmetric two tensors of weight one. So now this uh, the EAB is a building is a basic building block in the construction of higher conformal fundamental forms, because what we can do now is we can uh, apply a conformally covariant version of taking normal uh, derivative sufficiently uh, number of times and that's the way in which the eighth fundamental form can be defined which is visible in 23 so we take we take a conformally covariant version of taking normal derivative in the direction of the normal vector and apply it i times to the extension e and then take a trace free projected part and that's our that's the definition of higher order conformal fundamental form so now I'm not going to talk about the construction of this conformally covariant version of taking normal derivative, but in the first approximation, one can think about this operator uh, uh, in terms of applying Thomas D operator and then contracting it with the extension of the unit normal tractor NE. And obviously, if you expand this expression, then the leading transverse order term will just be uh, net derivative in the direction of the, the unit normal vector. Okay, so now uh, one can check that the, the leading terms in the, in, the, in the third, fourth, and fifth conformal fundamental forms are projections of Weil, Cotton, and Bach tensors. 
And moreover, on a generic n-dimensional manifold, one can use this formula, one can use this definition of higher conformal fundamental forms to compute every conformal fundamental form up to n minus one to one. So there is a, if you try to apply it further, then you will, one encounters a problem when computing the end fundamental form because this is not a not a term which can be defined in a local tubular neighborhood of the boundary, but it's instead a, a, a term which which you need you need to you need the global information about the manifold to 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 get this term. Or in other words, it's a it's an image of the Dirichlet to Neumann map map for Poincaré Einstein feeling, but it's 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 not a really a topic of this lecture so i'm not going to talk about it here so the main point is that here is that you can use this definition of higher order conformal fundamental forms to extract every conformal fundamental form up to n minus one to one okay so that was it in uh, that that was all in this part this part of the lecture series so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to apply the, the this this tractor calculus and definition of conformal fundamental forms in the general relativity, starting from asymptotically the Seeder space lines. Uh, yeah, but before I'll talk about asymptotically the Seeder space times. Um, let me let me tell you what what I mean what I mean by a space time. So space time will be a manifold m tilde with a metric g tilde such that uh, g tilde is a solution of the Einstein field equations twenty five, where, where you have the, on the, on the left hand side you have the geometry, so the Ricci tensor, the metric, and the positive cosmological constant positive because I want to talk about asymptotically the Sitter space times as opposed to asymptotically anti the Sitter space times. And on the right hand side of 25, we have a source in the form of symmetric uh, physical symmetric stress energy tensor T tilde. Now, the way to view Einstein field equations here is as follows. So you can imagine that there is a list of admissible matter, uh, matter models. And each matter model has its own equation of state and its own stress energy tensor. So what you can do to solve Einstein field equations is, is you can select your favorite matter model, plug its stress energy tensor to the right hand side of 25, supplement the Einstein field equations with suitable uh, equation of states for the matter fields and then solve for the metric and uh, the variables describing your, your, your chosen matter field. Okay, so, but I want to talk about specific class of space times, which, uh, is, which are asymptotically the Sitter space times. And the standard way in GR to define asymptotically the Sitter space times is via conformal extension of a, of, of a, of a space time. So now we're, I'm forgetting about tractor calculus and conformal geometry and just just my definition of asymptotic the sitter space time will be as follows. So if I have an asymptotic the sitter space time uh, in a form of my manifold M tilde and the metric G tilde, which I will now call physical manifold and physical metric G tilde, then the asymptotic the sitter space this asymptotic the sitter space times uh, space time is usually de defined through conformal extension. Uh, so, which has the following property. So this conformal extension is a manifold M and the metric G, which I'm going to call unphysical metric, such that following points hold. So uh, M is a manifold with a boundary sigma. The, the physical manifold M tilde can be thought of as the interior of M. So there exists a smooth function omega such that it's positive in the interior of M and it's zero with non-zero gradient on the boundary. Uh, the physical metric G tilde can be defined as one over omega squared times the unphysical metric G. And the 
the stress energy tensor T tilde, which can now be called physical stress energy tensor, is omega to some non-negative power Q times, times the unphysical stress energy tensor T. And obviously the unphysical metric G and unphysical stress energy tensor T are regular everywhere on, 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 the, on the manifold M. Now, uh, apart from the obvious interpretation of the, the boundary sigma as a conformal infinity uh, in, of the conformal extension, I want to think about this hypersurface uh, in terms of end state of the evolution of my asymptotic Lissiter spacetime. And to, to, to describe what I mean by the end state of the evolution of the asymptotic Lissiter spacetime, let me do a simple example. And this example is the usual four dimensional Decider space time. So uh, I'm just going to assume the, that in this example that the cosmological constant lambda is free. And if, all, if you do it, then uh, the the, sitters, the four dimensional Decider space time can be described by as a hypersurface described by equation 26 in five dimensional Minkowski space time. Now, if you compute the induced metric on this hypersurface defined by 26, then the, the result is visible in 27. So the, the result is just the, the sitter metric, where GS3 is the, the metric on the unit free sphere. Now, because there is a symmetry in time, I'm just going to focus on the, the T, on the coordinate T going from zero to infinity. And if I do it and introduce new coordinate tau defined by relation 28, then uh, the range of t going from t going from zero to infinity corresponds to tau going from zero to pi over two. And the, the sitter metric written in terms of this new time coordinate tau becomes uh, 29. So what, what I can do now is I compare uh, the form of the metric from 29 with the definition of asymptotically the Cedar space time. And so in, to be precise with the definition of the physical metric versus unphysical metric. So from the fourth point here, so we see that the physical metric uh, was defined with one over omega squared times some regular unphysical metric G. So if you compare this definition with the metric 29, you will see that this uh, this conformal factor omega in this example is just cosine tau. So the conformal infinity, which was defined as the, the, the hypersurface where omega is zero, corresponds to the to tau being pi over two, which in turn corresponds to t to, to my original coordinate t uh, uh, being infinity. And that's precisely what I mean by the end state of the evolution of space time, because if I, if I imagine some asymptotically the Cedar space time, then there's uh, and, and some evolution in the space time which, which is going toward the Cedar space time in the end, then there is, a, there is always some kind of time coordinate and this conformal infinity will just correspond to, the, to this co time coordinate going to infinity. So that, that, and that, that's, that's that's why I want to view this, this conformal infinity as the end state of the evolution of my asymptotic Lissiter space time. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to use structure calculus and my defin and the definition of the conformal fundamental forms that I talked about earlier to study the, G the conformal infinity of any asymptotic Lissiter space time. But before I do it, uh, I'll go through the standard way of dealing with asymptotically the Cedar space times in general relativity uh, and hope. A uh, question about yeah. this, this, this um, uh, name, asymptotically the Cedar. So in, uh, I mean, the Cedar's constant curvature, right? But I mean, in your definition, the asymptotically the Cedar, there was nothing about curvature, asymptotic uh, behavior of curvature. Yes, but actually there was because uh, this underlying definition of physical versus unphysical stress energy tensor means that if where we if if you approach 
uh, omega equals zero hypersurface, then your <clears throat> stress energy tensor decays to zero, which means that your curvature decays to the constant curvature because there is a there is an obvious relation between stress energy tensor and curvature because I assumed that the Einstein field equations hold. Okay, so it's actually going to be in the limit constant curvature story. Uh, yes, we, yes, we, exactly. We, that's that's why this 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 relation between stresses stress energy tensors is underlined because that's the key point. Actually, for me, that uh, for me that's the key point of the definition of asymptotically dissipated space time. Because what you what I'm doing here is I'm assuming that as we as time goes to infinity, stress energy tensor basically decays to zero, because Q is non-negative here. Okay. Which means that we're approaching uh, space time on constant curvature mm -hmm. because 25 holes. Thanks. Okay. Uh, okay, so before I'll talk about uh, applying tractor calculus in this setting, let me go through a standard way uh, to deal with uh, asymptotically the sitter space times in general relativity. And hopefully, this will justify. Uh, I'll, you will see that it's not really an, uh, mo the most efficient way to to to. It's not mo the most efficient way if you, to to deal with things if if I just want to study the local geometry of the conformal infinity. Okay, so the assumption about the metric was well, uh, I've written again the assumption about the metric and that's equation thirty. So. Well, the, the the most immediate thing that can be done here is we can just plug this assumption of the met about the metric into Einstein field equations, or in the first step we can plug this assumption about the metric to compute the Ricci tensor, and uh, get the formula which relates the Ricci tensor of my physical metric G tilde with the Ricci tensor of the unphysical metric G, uh, and uh, and that's that's equation thirty one. So the two consequences of these equations are as follows. So first of all, since I'm, I'm actually interested in the, the conformal infinity, I need to look at the equation 31 and allow omega to go to zero, which immediately means that this equation is as, as the, the PDE is singular on the conformal infinity, because we have, we have those one over omegas and one over omega squared everywhere. And second consequence is, uh, that if we want to <clears throat> help ourselves and re remove the singularity by multiplying equation 31 by omega squared, that's, then this will not really help us because if we, if I multiply 31 by omega squared, then the, then the principal part of this equation, so the second derivative, the part with second derivative of omega will be, will be, will vanish at the conformal boundary. So in terms of uh, viewing this as a well post PDE system, there then there is no hope, and uh, we 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 can help ourselves by multiplying by omega squared. Now, because of those problems, there is a certain uh, there is a complicated procedure to 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 deal with asymptotically the Sitter space times in and and. Uh, and then write Einstein field equations as a in terms of well post PDE system. And this procedure was introduced by Helmut Friedrich more than 40 years ago in a paper visible here. And just let me start by saying that this procedure only works in four space time dimensions. And when this decay of the stress energy tensor parameter Q is greater or equal than one. So the first step in deriving. So, so th this procedure basically consists of starting from Einstein field equations, assuming that we, we are, we're in a setting of asymptotic the Sitter space time and writing down an equivalent system which allows us to go to the conformal infinity. So the first step in deriving such system is uh, looking at the conformal transformation rule for the Skouten tensor. And after doing some manipulations and rewriting some terms in, a, uh, in terms of stress energy tensor, one arrives at equation 32. 
where we see now that this principal uh, part with omega, so the second derivative term with second derivative omega behaves nicely all the way up to conformal boundary, and that's the term on the left hand side of 32. And on the right hand side, we have some amount of uh, scout and tensor corresponding to the unphysical metric, the scalar S, which is defined in 33, and it's usually called the Friedrich scalar and the trace-free part of the physical stress energy tensor. So now, but now the price to pay for having a nicely behaving uh, leading principal part of the equation is that we need, now need to promote the fields S and the PAB to the level of unknowns and prolong and close the system. So to derive the equation for my new variable S, I can now I can just apply a derivative to 32, commute, use some Bianchi identities, and the end result is visible in 34. And to derive the equation for the second new unknown PAB, one can just look at Bianchi identities and they will lead us to equations 35 and 36, where I defined two new tensors, small w, which is just one over omega times the vial tensor and Q, which is one over omega times the cotton tensor corresponding to the physical metric G denoted here by A tilde. So from some other considerations, we know that the tensors defined in 37 have regular limits when we go, when we go to the conformal infinity. So equations 35 and 36 don't have any singularities. Now, uh, the last equation which is needed to close the system is basically a conformal transformation rule for, for the Ricci curvature, and that's equation 48, where we have cosmological constant and the trace of the physical stress energy tensor. Okay, so uh, what I did here is, uh, to summarize what I did here is I started from Einstein field equations 39, I assume that I am in the setting of asymptotically the Sitter space-time, so I assume that the metric and the physical stress energy tensor have conformal transformation rules visible in 40. And in order to <clears throat> use the assumption 40 in a nicely behaving system of PDEs, which are equivalent to the Einstein field equations 39, I did the prolongation and uh, promoted some 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 tensors and scalars uh, to, to my new variables. And the resulting system is the system visible here uh, in 41 to 45. And we want to, now we want to solve the system. Uh, so the unknowns of the systems are now conformal factor omega, the unphysical metric G, the scalar S and tensors PAB, small w, and uh, the unphysical stress energy tensor TAB from 46. So now, uh, and this system is called conformal Einstein field equations. So now if, we are, if I just want to look at the local geometry or the geometry of conformal infinity, I can look at my new system of sub equations, evaluate them on the boundary, and, and, and look at the, uh, the, the specific parts of those equations on the boundary. And what I'll get is I'll get 10 constraint equations induced by the system on my conformal infinity. And the, one of the main theorems here uh, re resulting from the constraints in vacuum is as follows. So if you give me a three-dimensional metric G bar and a divergence-free and trace-free <coughs> tensor D, then there is a solution of the vacuum conformal constraint equations on the conformal infinity, which enjoys certain conformal covariance in the sense that if you rescale the three-dimensional metric G bar uh, by some uh, theta squared and and uh, divide uh, trace free divergence free tensor by, by the same theta, then this will, will also give rise to, to a solution of those constraints. So in the end, if I want to use the standard way to describe <clears throat> asymptotically the Sitter space time, just to look at the geometry of conformal infinity, I need to go through 10 constrained equations. So it's, as you can see, this is not really a very efficient way to study the geometry of the conformal infinity. 
So what I want to do now is I want to you you just use the tractor calculus to to do it. So to to study the geometry of the conformal infinity in terms of constraints relating the conformal fundamental forms with the stress energy tensor. And to, in order to do it, let me write the Einstein field equations again, this time going back to arbitrary n dimensions. Uh, but I want to look at the trace free of the Einstein trace free and trace part of the Einstein field equation separately. So those those parts are written in 47. So now if I look at the trace free part and write it in terms of the scouting tensor or the trace free part of the scouting tensor, then this this trace free part of the Einstein field equations can just be written uh, in the form visible in 48. But since we know tractor calculus now, we know that there is a way to write the left-hand side of 48 in terms of the scale or in terms of the almost Einstein operator acting on some scale sigma tilde, which now corresponds to this to my physical metric G tilde. And that's what I did in 49. So the one last step to, to, to write my trace free part of, of the Einstein field equations in a conformally covariant way is to rewrite trace free part of the stress energy tensor and as some conformally covariant quantity. So what I want to do now is I want to assume that there exists a stress energy tensor density tau, which is a section of a bundle of symmetric two tensors of weight minus Q. And uh, yeah, and assume that this tau AB can be defined as, as sigma tilde to minus Q times the physical stress energy tensor T tilde. Now, before I plug this, um, this definition uh, back into equation 49, let's, uh, let me ask, uh, let me answer a question. Why is there a re relation between this, this weight minus Q here and this decay rate of the stress energy tensor in the fourth point of the definition of asymptotically the sitter space time here. And the short answer is yes, there is, because that's the same Q. And this can be seen as follows. So this, for this in this definition of asymptotically the sitter space time, I assume that the, tr the conformal transformation rule for the physical metric is as visible in 51. But now I know that both G tilde and G can be written in terms of scales. So I already defined the scale corresponding to G tilde as sigma tilde. So let me now denote the scale corresponding to the unphysical metric G as sigma G. That's the second equation from 52. So if you combine 51 and 52, then you can convince yourself that this conformal factor omega from the definition of asymptotic space spacetime can now be written as a quotient of sigma tilde and sigma g, as in 53. Uh, so now, <clears throat> using the definition of um, conformal weighted tensors, this, this, conf this uh, uh, stress energy tensor density tau can now be written in, in two different ways, either with the use of physical scale sigma tilde and physical stress energy tensor t, or with the use of um, the scale sigma G and unphysical tensor, stress energy tensor T. That's the second equation from 54, uh, which in turn gives the relation between the, the direct relation between physical stress energy tensor T tilde and unphysical stress energy tensor T. And uh, this, this relation is the first equation from 55. But since there is a there is a there, there is a quotient of sigma tilde and sigma g, then we can just use, using fifty three we can just replace it with omega, with omega, and and this in the end gives the uh, the equation that stress energy tensor t tilde is omega two power q times the unphysical stress energy tensor. That's the second equation for fifty five. So we see that by assuming that my stress energy tensor density has weight minus Q, I recovered my, my original assumption about the decay rate of the physical stress energy tensor because, uh, because of this, this omega to, to Q from the equation from, from the second equation from 55.
Okay, so now plugging this assumption about the, so, so replacing this physical stress energy tensor by uh, the, the stress energy tensor density in my trace free part of the Einstein field equations, the, 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 this equation can now be written uh, in the form visible in 56. We're now on the right hand side, we have a, uh, instead of some stress energy tensor, we have a stress trace free part of the stress energy tensor density and this, uh, this physical scale sigma tilde to an, an appropriate power. Now, of course, there is a, uh, we can prolong the system just I, as I prolong the usual Einstein, almost Einstein field equations. And if you do that, then you'll get an equation with nabla and uh, nabla t and the scale protractor corresponding to the to this to this physical scale sigma tilde visible in 57 where now you have some source term on the right hand side which has to do with trace three part of the stress energy tensor density okay so now going to the trace part of the einstein field equations so this trace part written here again in the form of 58 can be written rewritten in terms of tractors if you remember that there was a relation between scalar curvature and the i squared of some some appropriate scale so if we use this relation then equation 58 can be written as an as an alter, in an alternative way uh, as in 59 so now instead of having i squared of some sigma being just minus one, now I have some cosmological constant lambda and a trace of the stress energy tensor density on the right hand side. Okay, so now uh, just comparing this uh, as a way to compare things, I've written down the <clears throat> The, the standard equations that you work with in the tractor calculus with those with the equations uh, corresponding to the Einstein field equations. So previously, when I was just talking about tractor calculus, I assumed that I have some scale tractor I sigma, which is parallel. So that's the first equation from 60. And I also assumed that the singular Yamabe equation holds, which means that I squared of this scale was just minus one plus some terms of order n. But now, since I have since I have Einstein field equations, the right hand sides of equation sixty are modified. So in the Nabla I equation, I have some <clears throat> some some source term which has to do with trace free part of the stress energy tensor density. And the right hand side of I squared equations uh, picks up the cosmological constant lambda and the trace of the stress energy tensor density, as in sixty one. Now you might feel might feel uncomfortable that uh, that this Nabla I equation has this tensorial index, so everything is not fully conformally covariant. But let me assure you that I can <clears throat> I can just insert this Nabla I equation in a in a in a in a, in a tractor and get an equivalent equa equivalent fully conformally covariant equation, which uh, will have some Thomas D operator, operator acting on a scale tractor, and this, this guy will be equal to some uh, stress energy tensor tractor, uh, as in 62. But I'm not gonna use 62 here, I'm just gonna basically work with six, the equation 61. Okay, so now, uh, the what I want to do now is I want to use the, the definition of conformal fundamental forms uh, and apply it to the setting of asymptotically the Sitter space times. And this will give rise to some constraints relating the geometry of the conformal infinity with the stress energy tensor. And because uh, because I'm a physicist, I'm I'm just gonna go back to the physically relevant four space-time dimensions. But obviously, everything that I will say from now on can be extended to arbitrary number of dimensions. Uh, yeah, but before I'll talk about constraints with conformal fundamental forms, there is a simple constraint which can be derived right just by looking at equation sixty-one. Uh, because if I apply a derivative to the the I squared equation. Then uh, the, 
the derivative applied to the right hand side of this equation will give me some amount of derivative of the trace of the stress energy tensor density. But on the other hand, the derivative of I squared can be written in terms of the nabla I sigma. But we know that nabla I sigma has to do with has something to do with trace free part of the stress energy tensor density. So if I compare the, those two things, I'll get a first a very simple constraint uh, on the stress energy tensor density vis visible in 63. So we have some amount of uh, stress energy tensor density with the normal vector and hat, and hat hooked into it, some amount of this, its trace, and on the right-hand side, there is a divergence of this tensor. Okay, so now going to conformal fundamental forms. So let me recall that the basic objects object that was used to, to define those fundamental forms was this extension, conformally covariant extension of the trace-free extrinsic curvature uh, visible in 64. But now since my nabla i equation is modified and I have some source term, then I can I know that this <clears throat> this geometry this is the EAB will, will also equal some amount of trace free part of the stress energy uh, density tau multiplied by sigma sigma tilde to q plus one as in the second equation from fifty four. So the idea is that I can now take E and construct conformal fundamental forms by applying. Uh, an appropriate operator to the to the left hand side of 64, but since there is a stress energy tensor counterpart, this this conformal fundamental form will be equal to some operator applied to the right hand side of 64, so applied to the trace free part of the stress energy tensor density and evaluated on the boundary. So now in the first step, I can just uh, to get a constraint relating uh, which which with a second conformal fundamental form i can just take 64 and project and evaluate on the boundary and because i assume that uh, this this parameter q is greater than zero because i'm working in the setting of asymptotically the sitter space time the constraint here is that the conformal infinity of asymptotically the sitter space time is an umbilic hypersurface meaning that trace free part of the extrinsic curvature of this hypersurface is zero as in 65. Now moving forward to the third conformal fundamental form. So recalling the definition, I can apply uh, appropriate operator to, to my EAB, to the geometry part of the EAB. And what I'll get is the projected part of the vial tensor with two normal vectors hooked into it as in 66. But on the other hand, I can apply the same operator to the right hand side of 64, so to this, this trace free part of the stress energy tensor density, and uh, as in 67. And if I combine 66 and 67, then uh, I immediately get that if Q is zero, then the, the, the constraints relating third fundamental form of the stress energy tensor is as visible in 68. So some so the the projected part of the vowel tensor with two normal vectors hooked into it equals some one half times the projected part of the stress energy tensor on the conformal infinity. And obviously, if Q is greater than zero, then the constraint is trivial in a sense that this the constraint is that the, this this part of the vowel tensor is just zero there. Okay, so now <clears throat> the next fundamental form is an interesting one because remember I told you that if we're in n space-time dimensions, then we cannot use this definition of conformal fundamental form to extract the, the end fundamental form. And this is precisely what's going on here. Because if we try to uh, <clears throat> apply the definition of conformal fundamental forms uh, uh, to, to get this fourth one, then what we'll get, assuming that the hypersurface is umbilic, then we'll get uh, we'll just get zero by applying this this uh, operator to the geometry part of E. So this this just give immediately give rise to a constraint uh, 
constrained on the trace three part of the stress energy tensor because I can now apply the same operator to the stress energy tensor counterpart of E and the, the, the constraint which I'll get is, is, is visible in 70. Now, uh, but from some other considerations, we know that the fourth fundamental form should, 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 should have something to do with the cotton tensor here. And there is a trick to, to get some information about the cotton tensor in this setting, <clears throat> or more precisely about the divergence of some projected part of the cotton tensor in this setting. And the trick is as follows. So assuming that my parameter, my, my DK parameter Q is greater or equal than one, then I can use gauss codas equations and the constraint coming from the third fundamental form to see that actually the whole vial tensor is zero on the conformal banding. So if the whole vial tensor is zero and everything is smooth, then I can assume that, <clears throat> that the first term in the expansion of the vial tensor in terms of the, my, my, my defining density sigma tilde is, uh, is small w as in 72. And now what I can do with 72 is I can look at the definition of a tractor curvature. So I can, I can apply two tractor connections to my scale tractor, commute them, extract the tensorial slot with my Q star operator. And on one hand, this will give me uh, my, uh, my, this will give me sigma tilde times the cotton tensor plus this small W tensor that I defined uh, a second ago. But on the other hand, I know that the nabla applied to I sigma can be written in terms of stress energy tensor, and that's the second line from 73. Now, because I assume that Q is greater than one, I can just divide the, the divide the equation 73 by sigma tilde. And what I'll get is that the projected part of the cotton tensor with one and normal vector hooked into it equals this a projected part of the small W tensor with two, uh, two normal vectors hooked into it on the boundary, just like in 74. So now using some Bianchi identities, uh, I can immediately get, uh, get a relation between the divergence of the cotton tensor from this part of the cotton tensor from 74 uh, in terms of stress energy tensor, and that's that's that this relation is visible in 75, and obviously it depends on the value of the DK parameter Q. So this, in fact, is so, so from some other consideration, we know that this projected part of the cotton tensor with one N hooked into it is the, the this should be the fourth fundamental form. So what I got here is I got a constraint relating the di divergence of this, uh, the, the hypersurface divergence of this conformal fundamental form in terms of stress energy tensor in the form of 75. Now, one last, uh, one, one last constraint that I want to talk about the, uh, is a constraint with the, the fifth fundamental form. So again, if I apply this, uh, this operate my, my, my operator defining the fifth fundamental form to the geometry part of the extension tensor E, I'll just get something proportional to the projected part of the Bach tensor, that's 76. And on the other hand, applying the same operator to the stress energy tensor counterpart gives me uh, in the end co constraint 77. So I know that the projected part of the Bach tensor has to do with, with uh, various parts of the st stress energy tensor density, and the, those parts depend on the on my parameter Q. But that's not the end of the story of the Bach tensor here, because in fact, I, I, I can uh, get some information about the remaining part of the, the Bach tensor, so about the normal, normal, and normal projected part of the Bach tensor in terms of uh, stress energy tensor density. And this can be done as follows. Uh, sorry. So I can apply a commutator of two Thomas D operator to the scale tractor and just compute that this, this guy will be equal some uh, tractor projectors X and Z and the Bach tensor with one N hooked into it as in 78. 
But on the other hand, I know that the, the commutator of 2D operators can be written only in terms of nabla i sigma, but I know that nabla i sigma equals some amount of stress energy, energy tensor. So using this information and combining it with 78, I can immediately get uh, some, some, some constraints relating the normal, normal, and normal projected part of the Bach tensor uh, written in terms of stress energy tensor density. And that's, that's equations eight. Okay, so that was it. So that to summarize this talk, so what I did today is I looked at the asymptotically the Sitter space times and I applied the definition of uh, conformal fundamental forms to extract, to, to, to derive some constraints relating various tensors, so the, the projected parts of vial and Bach tensors and the divergence of the projected part of the cotton tensor. Uh, with the, the, st the stress energy tensor density of the asymptotically the Sitter space time. Okay, so that's it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for the nice lecture. Um, are there questions? Uh, hi, uh, Yaroslav. Uh -huh. uh, can I see your, your last slide? I mean, the one before? Yeah, sure. Okay, so you get this constraint on the bar tensor. So j just to make sure this N is not null, it's, uh, it must be Timelike, or was it anti the sitter? So it uh, -like? yeah. So maybe I, I I haven't stressed this out, but the yeah the n is timelike because the boundary is space like. Okay. okay. So, so, so that that's why so that's why I am working with asymptotically the sitter space times because the sitter means that the cosmological constant is positive, which means that the conformal boundary is space time. Oh, okay. And so, so this condition on the Bach tensor is uh, throughout space time. It's not only on the boundary, is it? Yeah, that's true. But since I was talking about constraints on the boundary, then I just used it, used it to, to derive some constraints on the boundary. But you're right. It's 78 and 79 holds in the bulk. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Uh, that, that, that's uh, an interesting condition. I've come across it in some other place. So, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you.